everybody. Welcome back to Digital Hammurabi. My name is Megan Lewis and I am today's host. And today I am joined by Dr. Aaron D'Souza, who's uh, very kindly agreed to talk to us about uh, ancient Nubia. Dr. D'Souza, thank you so much. Hello, thank you for having me. Of course. Uh, Dr. D'Souza is the Marie Sklodowski Curie Fellow at the Institute for Oriental and European Archaeology, uh, focusing on ancient Nubia. He's also the co-founder and editor of a new journal, which is entirely open access, uh, which for those of you who are not familiar with academic journals, it's incredibly exciting. No, normally you have to subscribe to them, uh, but it's called the Interdisciplinary Egyptology Journal. Uh, so uh, that is an exciting thing. Um, Dr. D'Souza, could you please introduce yourself, uh, explain a bit about what your specialism is and how you got into the field? Sure. So um, my name is Aaron D'Souza um, and my specialization is the material, culture and archaeology of Nubia, which is the region, sort of the southern half of Egypt, the northern half of modern Sudan, um, during the mid second millennium BC. And I look at specifically three cultures that sort of populated the Nile Valley called the Pangrave, the Sea Group and the Kerma traditions. Um, my PhD was about the Pangrave tradition, particularly the ceramics. Um, but I'm now sort of having to broaden that a bit more to look at the, the material culture in general, their practices, the way they do things, um, burial customs and things like that. Um, and the project that I've been working on for the Marie Curie project, which is this two-year thing that is soon to be winding up, unfortunately, um, but will be continuing in some form, um, is to try and find links between all of these various cultures. So at the moment, they're all they're, they're perceived as being three separate entities, three, three different cultural entities, but there's a lot of links between them. And I think those links are not yet fully understood and we, we don't really have a way of explaining them thoroughly. So that's that's what the project has been all about. Um, as to how I got to this topic, um, it's a very long and winding path that got me to archaeology. Um, I'll do give you the short version. So I finished school, did two years of a uh, Bachelor of Education degree to become a high school teacher, got into a high school classroom and realized very quickly that this is not what I want to be doing with my life. Um, and then had to take a hard think about what I was, what I wanted to do. And I realized that I spent most of my time in the lectures to do education, drawing pictures of shoes and clothes and buildings and what have you. Um, and I'd done all um, art all the way through high school. So I went and studied a Bachelor of Design, um, specializing in textile and small object design, um, graduated from that, got a job working in fashion, hated it, left, got a job working for the a government arts organization, which was fine, but I wasn't particularly stimulating. And I thought, well, you know, I'll just go to university and do a master's degree in something that I enjoy doing, which was Egyptology. Um, so I started a master's in Egyptology at Macquarie University. Two years later, found myself in Egypt doing field work and then realized, unlike teaching, that this is this felt much more like what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and had been going back to has actually have been back to Egypt every year since then, except for this year, of course. Um, but yeah, and then the, the Nubian stuff was also kind of by accident because I was doing my master's thesis on Egyptian pottery of the second intermediate period. Um, and it turned out to be, I think it was like 15 or 20,000 words too long. And so I had to shave it down, but I thought, well, if I shave it down, then it's not really going to be very good anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but there was this chapter in there called the Pangrave culture, um, which was at that point about 4,000 words long. And so I said to my supervisor, this is with six weeks until my submission date, by the way. Um, I said to my supervisor, I would like to take that chapter and expand it to 15,000 words and make it my new master's thesis. And he kind of like choked. <laughs> um, and was, he's like, are you sure? And I said, I think so. Um, and he said, look, you know, he said, I trust you. I'm sure you know what you're doing. If you think you can do it, do it. Um, and it ended up being far better than the original thesis was and it ended up becoming my PhD topic, which ended up becoming a book, which ended up becoming this Marie Curie project. Um, so it's sort of, it was a long way to get there. But I mean, like all the design stuff was not unused because I learned how to make objects before I learned how to study them. Mm -hmm. um, so it sort of gave me a, a better understanding of how things work and the relationships between people and their things and, and all that sort of stuff. So it was, it was a long route, but none of it was really wasted time actually if you think about it, it it sounds like a fantastic journey into archaeology <laughs> oh that's wonderful yeah. i feel very strongly for your poor advisor <laughs> <laughs> but it but worked out he, to his credit, he did trust me and say you know mm -hmm. i trust you if you think you can do it 
Yeah. And you were um, clearly onto something because it's, so, yeah. it's kept you going uh, yeah. since then. Uh, so when we when we talk about the study of Nubia, exactly like what geographical region, what time region, what do we know about the people who inhabited the area? Um, it's it's a tricky thing to define. So normally when we talk about Nubia, we mean the little according to ancient Egyptians, at least the land south of the first cataract, which is a modern Aswan, um, which then means that we're looking at the southern half of, or southern third of Egypt, I guess, and then a substantial portion of northern Sudan. Um, but what we understand as Nubian now sort of tends to be very heavily focused on the Nile Valley. Um, chronologically, it could be anything from the Neolithic through to, you know, Christian mm -hmm. and beyond that. Um, but we could all, the, 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 the sort of the edges and the boundaries of Nubia are quite undefined and a bit amorphous. So we should really look out into the Eastern desert, into the Western desert as well. Um, we can look further south into Africa and also the, the lecture I gave the other day for the Bardet Museum. Um, I talked about how there was a lot of Nubian evidence in what we now consider to be Egypt and mm -hmm. what, what the ancient Egyptians considered Egypt. So the scope of what Nubia is, um, is I think a lot bigger than what people thought it was 100 years ago. Mm. Um, and there's, you know, it's it's populated by all sorts of cultures for, for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so yeah, it's 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 a big, big field that, with a lot of work that needs to be done in it. Excellent, thank you. Um, why has the study of Nubia historically been separated from the study of Egypt? And does it make sense from an, an academic point of view to separate them into two different categories? Um, so th I think the, re the, well, the main reason that it's been treated separately is because the study of Egyptology and Egyptology as a discipline was set up in a very colonial period um, where um, there's a really great lecture by Alice Stevenson a few months ago where she talked about these things called layers of colonialism, which I thought was a really nice way of putting it because the people that went into Egypt to study Egypt were the French, the Prussians and the British who all had grand imperial aspirations in Africa. Um, and in Egypt, they saw these big monuments. They wanted to try and link that to their their, their greatness of their empires. Um, and so Africa and Nubia, which is south of Egypt, was something different. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was kind of not, it was not Western. And Egypt kind of became falsely Westernized in a way and sort of falsely Europeanized, um, which is, of course, the problem that we're now all grappling with is this sort of false um, Europe, Europe, Europeanization is quite hard to say. Um, and all these colonial legacies that have sort of attached themselves to the, the discipline that we need to try and break out of. Um, but Africa and Nubia was always treated as something different or less mm -hmm. than or not as sophisticated. There wasn't a civilization. Um, but we're now understanding that this is actually, this is not true at all and that there are very, very ancient civilizations that did populate the Nile Valley and beyond that um, in Africa. Um, and I've forgotten the second half of the question. What was the second half of the question? Does it, does it make sense to study them separately? Um, no, absolutely not. So, and this is another thing that I've been pushing for, and I know a lot of other people have been pushing for, is a better integration of Egypt or the study of ancient Egypt and the study of ancient Nubia and Africa more broadly, because, I mean, first of all, Egypt is on the African continent. That mm -hmm. cannot be denied. Um, Egypt was also, of course, a conduit between the Levant, the Mediterranean, the Near East and Africa and going into Europe as well. So we can't separate Egypt from all of those things and in the same way we can't separate Nubia from all of those things. And as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a lot of Nubian evidence in Egypt itself. So the two, well, they're not even two really, they're like, they're just one big story that is this big, complex, integrated a time very messy story um, that we need to unravel and we can only unravel that if if we work together. And, and I guess kind of the, the separation that exists between the study of Egypt and the study of Nubia slash the rest of Africa is a hangover from this colonial legacy. And if we continue to keep them separate, um, that colonial, colonial legacy, Overtone, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it'll just keep carrying on. Mm -hmm. um, unless we break ourselves out of it. So what? how how did the Egyptian state relate to the different Nubian civilizations? Um, on an official level, 
um, on an official level, at least in, in their writings and things, they obviously tell us that Nubia is, or Nubia, not, e not even just Nubia, but anything that wasn't what they considered Egyptian mm -hmm. um, was vile, was wretched, was there to be conquered, was there to be exploited, and so on and so forth. Um, and that, I think, kind of got picked up by the, the early scholars who, the, you know, the early 20th century and, and late 19th century, who carried on that legacy of Egypt being this superior mm -hmm. thing. Um, and of course, you know, we know that in the 25th dynasty, the Nubians and the Kushite kings did conquer Egypt. So there was this real push and pull between Egypt and, and the lands to the south. Um, but in reality, when we look at the archaeology, we can see that there was never, that the, the real people on the ground probably didn't really perceive that difference and that there were Nubians or, you know, Nubians um, present in Egypt and burying themselves in Egypt, working for Egyptians, working alongside Egyptians, trading with Egyptians way back into the pre-dynastic period and probably far beyond that. And likewise, the opposite was happening in, in Nubia. There were Egyptians always going into and through and living in Nubia. Mm -hmm. um, so the official image that we get from the pharaohs and the 1% of the population who could read and write um, tell us that Nubia is bad. But actually, we know that they, they relied on Nubia for a lot of things. And I think that this is um, one aspect that we need to keep in mind with the way that Egyptians talk about Nubians is that it, they make it seem like Nubia is less than or worse or vile or wretched or whatever, but actually they were dependent on Nubia for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And in some ways they were also afraid of Nubia. Um, and, the, you know, the fortresses that they built in the Middle Kingdom were, you know, we perceive it, or you know, early we perceived it as Egyptians imposing their dominance on Nubia. But is it also, if you look from the other way, their efforts to keep Nubia away, at, at, in control because they knew that it was it was a it was a threat, mm -hmm. um, and that we know that th all through history, Nubians were coming up into Egypt and raiding Egypt and things like that. So that there was a lot of tension between the two. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned earlier there are three distinct cultures that are generally studied under like, the study of, of Nubia. Could you talk about them a little bit more? Uh, yeah, so those those three cultures that I mentioned are the, the middle Nubian cultures. So that's the period roughly between sort of all that coincides with the Middle Kingdom and the Second Intermediate Period in Egypt, so like 2000 BC until about 1500-ish. Mm. Um, and those three are... So Kerma, who most people will be familiar with, um, has its main urban center at Kerma in Sudan. Um, they were, at least we believe them to be, the biggest, the most powerful, the most influential. We call them, you know, you hear of them being referred to as Kushites. Um, and they had this big city. They had very distinct burial customs and such. Then we have the C group, who is kind of much older, actually, than and, and Kerma and Sea Group are, are a lot older than the middle Nubian period. They go back into the early Nubian, which I will touch on in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but the Sea Group is mostly in lower Nubia. They also have their own distinct burial customs as particular material traditions. Um, they also have seem to be sort of semi-sedentary. There's a, a town called Wadi Asebua, which is a walled town, which we believe to have been a Sea Group settlement, but they also have smaller campsites around the place. And then there's the Pangrave tradition, which is one that I'm interested in the most, and they are literally everywhere. So these are nomadic populations of pastoralists who had herds of cattle and goats. Um, most of their remains are fairly ephemeral. There are a lot of cemeteries around the Second Cataract and all throughout Lower Nubia, into Middle Egypt as well. Um, but they are everywhere, and they seem to sort of be in contact with a lot of people in different places in different ways. Um, but those are just the three that are in this particular, you know, maybe maximum 500 year stretch of time. Mm -hmm. um, but then before that, we've got the A group Nubians who are also in lower Nubia. Um, then we've got all the prehistoric and um, Neolithic cultures. Um, there's also later cultures that, you know, we, we can look forward to the, the Kushite kings that ruled Egypt in the 25th dynasty. Then there's the X group, which, you know, probably is not so. I think it's a bit shaky these days. Um, there's also there was a B group that disappeared um, because, or I mean, as disappeared as in academically disappeared because mm -hmm. people realized that it was, isn't really a thing. Um, there's also cultures out in the deserts called Jebel Moya, Jebel Mokram, the Gash group, the Butana group, all these other things all around the place. So it was a very, very diverse, culturally complex and interconnected 
region. And even though we perceive them as different things, there is a lot that actually connects them um, culturally and yeah, the, the, they're culturally very, very similar and related. So what, what kind of continuities do you see between all the different cultures? Um, they seem to all, I mean, the, the, the obvious superficial things are the pottery styles. So everyone knows black top pottery from Egypt, the pre-dynastic period, which is when the Egyptians made it and then they sort of stopped making it. Um, in Nubia, they continue that tradition. So all of these Nubian cultures that I mentioned have some kind of black topped pottery um, and they kind of bring it to the, the pinnacle, I think, at least of ceramic production in, in this region of Africa, which is these kerma beakers, these beautiful bell-shaped, mm -hmm. shiny, polished sh um, beakers with the white bands around the, the middle. Um, and they're like eggshell thin. So, so Nubians take these traditions and they maintain them and they refine them to a point of them being like... What just, we consider they're, art, essentially. Yeah, they're, 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 they are art. They're, they're sort of these beautiful almost magical and quite powerful objects when you when you hold them that it's mm. like holding air it's they're, they're so beautiful and light um but there are other elements of their culture so they all seem to have similar burial customs um but there are differences and variations most of the burials are circular with contracted burial positions of the body lying on the side with its knees bent and arms bent um tumulus structures of some kind some incorporation of animal offerings, so usually heads of cattle or goats or, or sheep, um, which were arranged in rings around the graves or put inside the graves. Um, there's a link to pastoralism and sort of livestock animals that, that have a real importance for these traditions. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that there's a lot that makes them identifiable as traditions, but there is there are all of these things that that link them, and these mm -hmm. I think is what we need to get to the bottom of is understanding these connections to figure out whether the divisions that we've imposed on them are actually valid or not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you specialize obviously in material culture. How do archaeologists use material goods to try and understand the identities of ancient people? Um, with great difficulty, I think is the answer to that question. Um, so we can look at objects and we can say okay well this let's say there's an egyptian person or an egyptian burial but he has a nubian or what we would call a nubian pot in mm -hmm. their grave um but then that is us imposing our assumptions of on that that pot is nubian and that thing is egyptian um which they may not have perceived that difference we, we don't really understand what their what their feelings or thoughts were about the objects that they have in their graves. And we also have to remember that the people in the graves that didn't choose those objects necessarily, they were put in those graves by other people. Um, but there are, the, 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 these people are silent in terms of their identity. And of course, identity is something that is self-defined, it's internalized, it's variable, it's incredibly fluid from day to day, from situation to situation, depending on the context or who you're talking to or where you are or what the weather is. Um, your identity or perception of your own identity can change. Um, so we, to get to their, their, their sort of their cultural identity or their social identity is virtually impossible. Um, we might be able to infer something about the decisions made by the people who made these burials. So why might they have chosen to include certain objects or certain co certain combinations of objects? Um, but in terms of getting to their identity, it's it's really, really difficult. Um, but what we can try and get an idea of is if we look at the relationships between those objects and the contexts and the other contexts around them and their environment and what we know of the people who lived in those regions, um, we can start to build a picture of how objects and peoples might have been in flux and in movement and how things became mixed and combined. So but there, but there are graves where um, at the fourth cataract, for example, where we have what at least look like um, Kerma type pottery and Pangrave type pottery and in, in combinations that you wouldn't expect. But then we can look at that and say, okay, well, this, this side of the fourth cataract is just across the bend from Kerma. So there could have been that easy access to Kerma stuff. Um, but also to get there, they would have had to traverse the desert. With, and we know that there were all these nomadic populations living in these desert regions. Maybe that's where these contacts happened. Um, and that's how these, these combination of objects 
came to exist. But then again, we we to get to the that particular individual's perception of those objects is is impossible. We can only put our interpretation upon it, but um, but it, which isn't always correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's tricky. Yeah, and I mean, I, I and in this sort of discussion, I often use myself as an example um, because I am from Australia, um, but I'm not blonde haired and blue eyed, so I don't look like the stereotypical Australian surfer type dude. Um, my parents are from Singapore, but their grandparents are from Portugal and the Netherlands. Um, I grew up eating Asian food in Western Sydney, um, but I speak English even though my parents speak to each other in Malay a lot of the time. Um, so on some level, I'm I'm Australian, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. And now that I've moved to Austria, I speak German. I cook Austrian food sometimes, but I would never identify myself or as Austrianized or my identity hasn't changed to being Austrian. Mm -hmm. um, and also depend, depending on who I'm talking to, as I said, like if I'm talking to an Australian friend, if I'm in Australia, my my background doesn't even factor in because Australia is so multicultural that people just see me as as Aaron and that's you're, it. You're an Australian yeah, dude. Yeah. Um, but then when I moved here, um, I suddenly felt very, very foreign because I outwardly look very different to the people on the street um, and realised that people would not speak to me in German because mm -hmm. they probably didn't assume that I could speak German. Um, and so I started to notice this sort of aspect of my identity, which I'd not really noticed before, and that mm -hmm. is that I'm a, a brown person, um, which never really factored in. Mm -hmm. um, but then, it, but it, since then, it's become a, a part of how I perceive myself. And then also I make an effort now to speak German sometimes, but sometimes I also make an effort to not speak German and highlight the fact that I am Australian. Um, and I guess, which is a little bit sad, I do it because I feel like it highlights my whiteness um, in, a, in a weird sort of way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's... It, it's it's a really it's a really complex topic, which is why you know if if you were to come into my kitchen, you would find a wok, a spätzle maker, um, all sorts of things from all different parts of the world. Um, but then I defy you to tell me who I am based on what's in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. so it's 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 that kind of difficulty that we're working with. Thank you. Um, do we know a lot about how these different groups of people in Nubia interacted with each other? Um. Yes and no. <laughs> so we, we, I mean, we have to assume that there was contact because they're all in the Nile Valley and the, the, the deserts around the Nile Valley at the same time in the same space. Mm -hmm. um, we know that objects were moving between populations and places and things. So, um, for example, we have this matte impressed pottery. So matte impressed pottery is, is got matting impressions on the outside, as the name suggests, but it's like a remnant of the technology. Um, and we find that at multiple sites along the Nile Valley from the fourth cataract, also out in the deserts a little bit, but also way up into Egypt. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that the people were there. It just means that the objects were moving. So we know that even though, or even if the people weren't moving, people were coming into contact with this material um, which meant that they were coming into contact with something other, um, which would have then changed their perception of themselves. And so we, we can sort of pick up on all those sort of things. Mm -hmm. um, but from distributions of objects, we can sort of get a sense of what things were moving and maybe how they were moving around and what people might have been coming into contact with in various places. Um, but in terms of their day-to-day -day interactions, it's, it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a colleague and, and friend, actually, a very good friend, um, Julian Cooper, who's doing work on Nubian languages, and he is of the opinion that, as I'm sure most people are, and it seems very logical, that a lot of these people were bi or multilingual. Um, and he sort of has pointed out that, that there is a lot of evidence that Egyptians were. And if you think that, you know, when Egyptians had to travel through Nubia um, to get gold or to get ebony or whatever they needed, they had to be able to communicate um, with people to tell them what they wanted. There's a lot of also apparently Nubian, Nubian loan words in the Egyptian language. Um, so there would have been a lot of crossovers and blending that, that made these interactions 
workable. Mm -hmm. um, so so the, the actual mechanics of how they interact with each other is difficult to get to, but we, we know that there was a lot of interaction and exchange going on between the two or between all of these groups actually. Mm -hmm. Are there some like classes of objects that are more portable, more transferable between groups than others? Um, I mean, like th things like jewelry, small things, beads and stuff. Um, but but pottery also, so this is another one thing with pottery where people sort of think that pottery is breakable and fragile. So therefore it's not something that people would carry around and move around with them. Um, there's, a, there's a really good PhD though by Catherine Grillo and it's not ancient pottery, it's about Samburu pottery. So these are also past, pastoral, partially nomadic groups. And they depend on pottery and they've actually said pot we need pottery to survive um and they because they need it to milk their their cattle they need it to bleed their cattle so they can use the blood for their food and whatever mm -hmm. um and i'm pretty sure that the same was the case in the ancient world because we see a lot of nubian pottery that has been repaired so it has been broken but it's valuable enough that they put it back together mm -hmm. um we see egyptian beads and jewelry and things turning up in in nubian graves um, we see Nubian objects turning up in Egyptian graves. So there isn't, there doesn't really seem to be, you know, objects that were more portable. Maybe there were objects that were more desirable, mm -hmm. um, like a faience bead or, a, you know, a beautiful Kerma beaker, which we find in a lot of Nubian burials, uh, sorry, Egyptian burials um, in Egypt itself. Um, maybe simply because they were just visually beautiful and people wanted one. Um, it doesn't necessarily have any relation about who or any bearing on who that person was or affect their identity. It just could be. They just liked thing. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but in terms of if objects were more portable than others or more, you know, transferable than others, not necessarily. Um, but we also do see not objects, but we also see ideas and ways of doing things and processes moving around. So in both Egypt and in Nubia, um, Ceramic technologies, for example, we can. There are a lot of hybrid pots. Um, the, the the term for that is debatable. People, some people don't like the word hybrid. Um, I know that Adela Fantina and Dietrich Rauwa calls it late middle Nubian imitation ware. Um, but these are examples of cooking pots that look Nubian in their style. So they've got Nubian style decoration. The shape is sort of Nubian. They don't have black tops, but they've painted a red band around the rim. But the technology is completely Egyptian. So they're made on a wheel which we believe anyway to not be a Nubian technology. Um, so there is sort of a mix of Egyptian technology and ways of doing things with Nubian aesthetics. And then vice versa, yeah. And then vice versa, we see um, Egyptian shapes. So carinated bowls, which are like they've got these sort of bent walls. Shoulder things. Yeah. And they don't occur in Nubian pottery normally. Um, but there are a number of, of examples of these sort of vessels, but made using Nubian technology in a red slipped black topped ware. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like they're merging ideas and, and ways of doing things. Um, we also there's also a pangrave object that has it's it's a skull, an ox skull that's painted with the figure of a man on it. Um, presumably a pangrave person, if we want to go down that path of identifying these people with things. Um, but it was found at a, a pangrave cemetery at Mostagheda in Middle Egypt. Um, and it's a typically pangrave object. So these painted animal skulls, there's goat skulls and cattle skulls have got this painted decoration on them. But this one has a picture of a man depicted in a very Egyptian manner. So his, his face is in profile, his eyes full face, his shoulders, he's got two shoulders and mm -hmm. a typical Egyptian stance. Um, and he's also got a hieroglyphic label next to him, which we don't, we can't translate, we know what it means, but it's a pangrave object or at least a pangrave style object, but with Egyptian style art on it mm -hmm. um so we see objects moving but also ideas and i think that that's that's quite interesting i think that's that speaks very firmly yeah. to like a deeper connection maybe yeah. than just simple trade yeah uh, that's that's really interesting so this was a clearly a very interconnected region oh, yeah. really. lots of groups of people that really relied on one another yeah, very much so and i think that the, the two story well, i keep saying the two stories even though even though i know it's wrong but um the, the story of Egypt and Nubia um, is so that it cannot, they cannot be extracted from one another. It is, it is one story. Um, and I think that's the message that I'm really trying to push is that it is just this one big story that we all are trying to unravel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so for you, where do you see the future of, of Nubian studies being? Um, so I think, 
I think the, the good thing with Nubi now is that we're we're um we're moving beyond the Nile Valley, um, which is which is a big step. Mm -hmm. um, we're now seeing that Nubia is is much bigger; that it encompasses more than just the cultures we've inherited from Petrie and Reisner back in the early twentieth century. Um, we're trying to move away from looking at the, just the objects to looking at how the objects were used, how the objects are distributed, how people lived, um, the relationships between sites across regions, the relationship between objects within an individual individual context and stuff. Um, the, the, the beauty of Nubia and working in Sudan, even though I've never worked in Sudan personally, um, is that um, we're able to take objects out of, out of Sudan and do scientific analysis on them. Mm -hmm. So we can do things like petrography, um, residue analysis, um, OSL dating, all the carbon fourteen dating, all these sort of things that give us a much more granular image of of what these cultures and peoples and communities and populations were doing, um, and how they use raw materials and how they use objects and why they do things in a certain way. Um, so I think that that's that's one of the strengths of working in with Nubian stuff is that we still can do that. Um, but I think what is important though is that there needs to be a deeper integration between Egyptology and mm -hmm. Nubian studies or Nubian archaeology or African studies or Nile Valley studies, whatever we want to call it. Um, because it's it's a it's a problem that sometimes I personally have also been told that I'm not really an Egyptologist because I do Nubian material culture. Yeah. Um, but then without people realizing that all of the material that I study actually comes from modern Egypt um, or, you know, even ancient Egypt, north of the first cataract. So I think that 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 attitude is changing, thankfully, um, but it is still it's still like a latent thing that is carrying on a little bit. But Nubian studies is 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 pushing forward with that sort of thing. Um, I think Egyptology needs to be pushed a little bit, mm -hmm. um, which is why. Um, so with the journal that you mentioned, that actually was founded by myself and my two colleagues and friends, also Christiana Kurlo, who's a professor of Vienna and Amber Hood, who's the uh, who's a postdoc at Lund University in Sweden. And the three of us got together and decided that we needed to do something um, to, to open Egyptology's doors. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not, not necessarily to, to get other people to come in, but to let Egyptology go out. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that that's the important thing. But I think that Nubia and people studying Nubia are really pushing in that direction, which is what we need. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, for those people who are listening and are interested in finding more about or finding out more about Nubia, um, there's at least one lecture of Aaron's on YouTube uh, that I believe you gave earlier this week. Um, so you can search for that and find it very easily. And if you are on Twitter, there are several fantastic Nubian specialists on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, there's Aaron, there's Salange Ashby and various others. And I'll try and put them in the description box below so you can follow them and, and follow their research. Um, because this is this is a really fascinating yeah. and um, think, area. And actually, like you're saying, that there's there seems to be a lot more dynamism in in people with in, in Nubian studies where you know we're using social media really actively. We're trying to reach out to people. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's not like a closed bubble. Yeah, um, we we actually want to be open and we want to share and we want people to to come in. Um, so yeah, it's it's really it's, um, you know thank you for saying that because of it course. is. I think um, that there are a lot of really great people doing a lot of interesting stuff. Yeah, no, there really are. Um, and we are going to take a one minute break um, so I can gather up all of the questions that are in the side chat. If you have a question for Dr. D'Souza, please put it in the chat now. I will not be taking extra questions once we are back. So type it out and tag me and we will be back in 60 seconds. If you'd like an expert to answer your questions, then make sure you join us live next time. Check out digitalhammurabi.com forward slash calendar for details of future interviews. And remember to bring your questions.
And we are back. Thank you very much, everybody. And we have a grand total of two questions, although people have been saying things along the lines of this is fascinating, but it's too far above me to actually ask decent questions. Um, ben has sent us $5. Thank you, as always, Ben, and says, was there a direct connection between Mesopotamian cultures and Nubia in the Bronze Age? Oof. Um, I don't think so. Um, Mesopotamia, not that I'm not that I'm aware of. I know that there are some Levantine objects um, like Tel El Yehudi aware um, in in Nubian burials, um, but this of course doesn't necessarily mean that there was a direct connection um, because those ob those objects presumably had to get through via Egypt. Um, there does seem to be um, some connections with Nubia and the Arabian Peninsula, um, which is easy to see because you know that you can basically swim across at a certain point um so with mesopotamia i'm i don't believe so i'm gonna uh, say i don't think so either no. No, at least nothing that i'm aware of it's a long um, way <laughs> <laughs> yes you have to go through the whole of egypt yeah. uh, pretty tricky but, yeah, but with the levant there are some sort of indirect connections mm -hmm. um but yeah again that's we you know that's not to say that there were levantine people going to Nubia or whatever. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and Jeff Cooper is asking whether a cataract in this context is like a choke point in a travel route. Um, yes and no. Um, so the, the cataracts, is, um, as most people know, are these sort of areas where the, the Nile is incredibly rocky, there's rapids, um, it can't be sailed, it's, it's much shallower, so it's harder to sail a boat past it, the Egyptians would have to take their boats onto land and drag them around the cataracts and then continue on their way. Um, but they were never really, um, they weren't, they were never choke points. As you said, there were, there were, um, they were, they were hindrances, mm -hmm. but they didn't stop anything. Um, it do, there does seem to be, you know, like the second cataract, maybe you could consider it to be more of a choke point because that's where the bulk of, um, C group and Kermo, uh, sorry, C group and Pangrave stuff does seem to thin out after the second cataract. Um, that could also, though, be due to the the, the land to me, immediately to the south is what we know as the Batan el Hajar, um, which is Arabic for the belly of the rock, and it's 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 can't be farmed. It's just mostly rocky desert, mm -hmm. um, so it's not really that easy to exist in or to traverse or whatever. So it could have been like a natural barrier, um, but in terms of their being hindrances to communication and trade and movement of goods and peoples, um, not really. They, they are physical, much. yeah, they're physical um, hindrances, but not, they, they, they can't be, they, well, they can be overcome fairly okay. easily. Thank you. And we do, we do actually have a couple more questions uh, that I missed. Um, Tessa asks if there are any, in, uh, any websites where someone can find information on Nubia. Um, there are a few you there are well there's my blog um, which is called um the in between nubia blog um and i can maybe send the link yes, for that, if you want to that um there's also a number of so you could have a look at um there's the kerma website that the um university of neuchatel has i think it's just kerma.ch if i remember correctly um there's there's a there's quite a lot of blogs actually for nubia um you could also look at i know that i'm um, solange ashby who you mentioned before um, she's working on a project called the Nile Valley Initiative, um, which is, it's not a website necessarily, but it's a place where you can go and consult about Nubian stuff. Um, there's, a, there's a Twitter feed for that as well. Um, but, but actually, as we just said, Twitter, Twitter is a really good place um, to find people who are working in Nubia. And I mean, if, if you want to, you can find me on Twitter and then find the people that I follow and see the things that I share and stuff, and that'll take you to places as well. Um, the Oriental Institute at Chicago has a lot. Um, and also, and also, you know, a lot of the museums around the place, like the British Museum has a fairly good, they've got that British Museum studies in ancient mm -hmm. Egypt and Sudan journal. Um, there's a lot of resources there about work in Sudan. Um, Sudan and Nubia is a journal that you can access online as well. So there are, there's a lot out there. There are places to go. Uh, I'm just making notes so I can put links to those places in the description for those who are watching after the fact. Um, and Fran Wilson asks, how were the Nubians affected by the Bronze Age collapse? Um, again, it's probably an indirect thing. Um, 
but there is this sort of thing that happens at around the same time where the, the middle Nubian cultures sort of go away. Mm -hmm. um, but then we don't really know why they go away. I mean, it could be, it could just be purely coincidental. Um, so, the, but I, I don't think there is any direct link. And direct because, yeah. And I think because we did have this buffer of Egypt, um, to maybe shield them a little bit, but it, but actually to be honest, it's a question that I haven't ever really considered. Actually, it's quite a good question. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't think there was any direct impact. Thank you. And that is actually it for questions. Thank you so much for joining us. This was very informative and enjoyable. No problem. It's a great pleasure. Of course. And thank you everybody for watching, uh, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? <laughs>